Um, welcome to this panel discussion, um, titled The Arts Fostering a Shared Humanity. My name is Mark Rappelt. I'm a writer and the editor of Art Review magazine in London and Art Review Asia, which is based in Singapore and Shanghai. I'm very delighted to welcome a very, very interesting and quite wide ranging series of panelists. Before we start, I just wanted to sort of maybe talk about what we might be discussing when we talk about fostering a shared humanity. I think after a year in which um, we've all become conscious of our individual bodies and other bodies as being potentially lethal disease carriers, um, and our worlds have collapsed in various ways, um, the idea that we can about communicating across about borders, across cultural and social divides, has become more important um, than ever before. And I think the arts are one of the ways through which these kind of discussions can be facilitated. Um, in a way in which um, similarities can be shared, differences add, and uh, no one needs to get hurt, hopefully, um, which is also quite an important part of it. Um, and all the speakers on the panel have a broad range of different backgrounds and interests. Um, some of them, some of us know each other, some of us are meeting almost for the first time. Um, but I think what the panelists all share is um, that they blend disciplines and practices, they uh, create dialogues that cross space um, and bring more than one conversation into a whole. And I think that's what we'll be looking forward to on this panel. Um, maybe to introduce the panelists, um, we have Eurydice Zaitino Kala, who is um, based in France as a visual artist, is a photographer in the market photo workshop in Johannesburg and makes work that explores historical and cultural metamorphosis. Um, we have Etienne Lina, who is a guest based in Zurich, the founder of um, Lillian and Ferrari, the contemporary art gallery. Um, so he operates, I guess, in a way between the artist and the audience, um, and on the distribution side of things. Um, so I think that would be an interesting, different perspective. Um, Christian Cosmos Meyer is an artist who's based in Vienna, um, and his work reevaluates history and also explores the dialogues between art and science. Um, Nena Akura, um, Akura grew up in Nigeria, um, is now based in Chile, um, where she um, also teaches. Um, but her work explores ideas of recycling, regeneration, um, the relationship between human detritus and natural growth in some ways, I think, and adaptation as a theme. Um, and then finally, we have um, Jules Andre, who is based in Los Angeles. Um, and his work, I guess, derives in part from the fact that he used to be in the experimental physics um, field um, and has translated a lot of those ideas into a, a kind of artistic and sculptural practice. So like I said, each of the participants um, brings an interesting mix of different cultures and different disciplines that are blended together and I think this could be interesting because I think one of the fundamental questions when we're talking about fostering shared humanities is partly what do we expect art to do? We know it can't always save the world um, but what can it do to make it easier to navigate? I'd like to uh, hand over now to our panelists and I think you really see if you'd be able to make a short presentation addressing this that would be great. Sure. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thank you for the invita invitation to think about it, think about this idea uh, of fostering art, being a cultural agent, um, always um, reflecting on how, with the power of art, uh, how, do, how does it circulate, how is it displaced, uh, being originally from Mozambique, uh, and then living as diaspora in South Africa and today in Paris, in, 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 in France, how am I, my presence is actually creating this idea of shared humanity already. I work around uh, archives, I work around image uh, thinking being in a way, and I'm always concerned with this kind of, um, uh, you know, 
coming and going and, and displacement of ideas. So, you know, the first, the first uh, point that came when we were thinking about fostering, I'm thinking about, you know, the etymology of it, parenting, nourishing, like, why are you know artists always um, put in this position of you know creating this better world, fostering, nourishing when we are part of this world? So I, I think yesterday we were speaking about you know Israeli conflicts and we were speaking about these these big uh, Colombian uh, conflicts and 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 the fact that we are so aware thinking about fostering, parenting, being a leader as an artist. I mean, make changes that uh, kind of risk colonial uh, is positioned. So the last point is, is to speak about leaders that to be able to share how are we making them visible, you know, because everything is shared communalities and common spaces for work so that's that's my my productive speak um but um not to be i mean this is different. of course a commercial um, gallery means that we have certain let's say, contribute as well to a certain awareness of what is around. Um, we are trying, of course, I mean, nowadays changed before. So since about 10 years, the art world has become maybe more independent than the bigger ones. Uh, are it's not so um, aware important um, subject and what we're trying to do is to give this so we don't really want to do this kind of art that follows something like uh, nowadays most artists have a brand and we're trying to give this so I think that's the, the most important thing. I mean, the shared humanity and how we're fostering this is kind of we're doing and to try to do something a little bit apart as a commercial gallery. Of course, we have some uh, rules and we have to run our the business. Okay, thank you. Thank you. I mean, I think that might be something we can come to later and the idea that there is a single art world um, is a proposition. Um, yeah. And perhaps different contexts have different ways of doing things or necessary and chosen. But um, maybe, uh, Christian, you could tell us. Okay. Uh, I actually think I will do pretty much the opposite because my statement is going to be pretty uh, broad, not so much focused on my specific work maybe. But when I was thinking, I thought it was obvious that it is asked from a point of view that acknowledges that this humanity, however we define this, um, finds itself in a state of deep crisis, you know, like the, of course, the massive ecological catastrophes that we're facing, uh, which put our, our future of a species at risk, but also many other species already gone extinct due to our human influence. And at the same time, there's the huge social injustice that we all know about uh, within our societies, but even more so between populations of different the world and then often leading to the devastating wars um, and at the same time, we have this disruptive new technological advances that I'm thinking about a lot because they completely change the way how we interact with the world. Be it the biotechnological innovations that are completely changing the way how we think about life and death and how we can actually intervene into these um, dimensions. Um, while at the same time, the developments in machine learning and the thing that we sometimes call artificial intelligence uh, there are complete societies are working by analyzing the data that we amass every day. And, and all in, in the midst of this uh, entanglement of things, um, I have to be honest that I have become more and more pessimistic in the last year. Uh, if we as a species would still turn the wheel around, you know, 
us and all the other species here are from this catastrophic future that one can foresee. And as much faith that I have in, in the value and the power invited to speak here, at the center of uh, of everything, right? And so we see where this and this disruptive shift in of, uh, you know, maybe. So I believe that art could foster this tolerance for ambiguity, a more just world. Uh, Perhaps not so pessimistic. Um, thank you, Christian, for that very impassioned um, introduction. Um, <laughs> I, I'm totally well, I have my um, reservations with the, the topic in general. I'm also um, hopeful to some form of, you know, change and awareness, even if it's not necessarily the sole agent of change uh, from a uh, an artist and educator. My experience, you know, I found that uh, the visual art, sound art, uh, poetry, literature, performance, whatever we like call the arts, um, have really represented a powerful tool for uh, not just expressing our shared experience, but, you know, um, keeping issues current and helping them stay, um, preventing them from settling. And so um, my understanding of this topic really comes from a place of uh, engagement with people and students and being in the learning environment. And as one who has been teaching for many, many years, over the years, I've found that um, a lot of impact on uh, the lives of people and, and I, I'm talking specifically in reference to students um, whom you know many of whom have come from different backgrounds a lot of times you know never encountering art before and having the ability to engage uh, in art through conversation and art making has uh, been an, a, an eye-opener for for them and helped them to to kind of begin to interrogate uh, their own lived experiences. Like you said, um, a lot of times, you know, art is kind of perceived through this European Western lens and uh, students who uh, often take art come from that background. And so they haven't really uh, gained exposure to other ways of thinking and other ways of seeing. And I've made it, I've made it my passion to, uh, poke into different subject matters, uncomfortable subject matters, to get people to, to see other ways of thinking, to experience other people's sensitivities. Um, and so art-based learning is something that I'm very passionate about. And I try to engage uh, group, you know, different people in groups, group activities as a way of expanding relationship, as a way of bringing people's guards down, as a way of enabling um, learning from a personal uh, from, from personal narratives, from perspectives and real life situations. And so um, as one who's also been involved in many uh, social engagements as part of my practice, I try to promote uh, ecological awareness. I don't know if you're aware, uh, part of my art practice is about um, changing the footprint and um, the, the ecological problem beyond or moving it away from the human-centered uh, focus, humans, but like you said, uh, Christian non-humans as well. And so um, I've had the benefit of uh, working with many communities, especially in my home base, uh, to to talk, to give them a voice, to be heard, and to give them a voice to to speak about their their, their truths and their troubles. Because I'm an African artist, like um, uh, Eurydice, um, I also come from to the world uh, reality from which I come. It's a very unique experience. And I think that art has the, ca the capacity really to, to help people to see the unliving. There are many humans that are under And um, I believe that through uh, diverse perspectives and sharing that we can help in general, and I'm gonna wrap up soon. I think that uh, if, if we can, if, if we can look at the micro uh, and so on, then, it's it's um it's in essence we kind of expand the way that we're working on a smaller thank you thank you um julian would you like to follow that a little uh help here maybe i can share my screen and see and hope that it works um let me know if you 
spots. Do you see that? Yes, I do. Okay, great. So I, you know, I, I come from a th I, the, all these points you were making they resonate deeply with me, and I and it's kind of interesting how they connect. So my background, and I'm not going to go into any detail, but for me it was really kind of in the uh, in the lab, and so and I'm just going to boil down to those like you know very like basic light things are separated. You know, we the you and the me are truly separated. You know, onion paradigm. It's definitely not uh, fundamental. It's more like a, something that emerges and in the process of getting into the mainstream, into the cultural mainstream, what we, you know, how our outlook onto the world has changed. Um, and the stuff is actually, there is, you can't say the me and the you are enough. We are, that appears as random. You know, stuff is not, not everything has a, a reason in that old school sense. And so departing from that, from that research and into biomolecules, proteins got very much involved in that, made a bunch of uh, uh, sculptures along those was most central always in my mind. And so the buckyballs, that's the kind of structure you see here, was the probe we used in our experiment to show that even those things. And so in, in this work, I, I, I kind of brought home that idea for me that, you know, you have these two worlds, they're almost like orthogonal, like almost like other dimensions, but we won ultimately. And you know, then I got into figurative works and I envisioned myself being that quantum object going through this experimental setup. And what would it feel like to be this quantum object? And I came up with this idea that this sort of waves perpendicular to the direction of motion. And so I made this quantum man a, a number of years ago. And this has been going on and on and on till today. Um, so I made a whole bunch of works more realistic, if you will, but always relied on that idea with the parallel slices. You, now they are all about the direction of the gaze. And so, and why I'm bringing this up and why this is to me interesting in this context of, of the, the shared humanity is that this work allowed me to expand. And I have now made in a few years ago this work people as if they are emerging as two separate mentions of a same underlying field, you know, they they live on the same parallel slice universe, if you will. That's the guy, that's the man, the woman. Look, that's in front of a physics building, actually. And so then I I started, it's really fascinating to me to see that the areas where, okay, that's his leg, but then there's this merge area where you can't see, oh, that's his nose or her nose. You know, so here's another one, a wall piece. And, then, and I'm showing that I'm ending up with this piece here that's I just installed this earlier this year. That's for a, a, a social justice park. And the idea was, you know, there's a group of people that makes change happen. And I was really interested in that idea, taking these people and showing them as fundamentally one. And what we call the, you know, the, the, the separate city is something that emerges on a, on a higher level. Uh, here's some images. And you see, we talked about the different species. You know, we, humanity is a pretty narrow you know, and I was struggling with that. And so she holds a chicken there in the in the front um, because I feel it's really important that it's not only that these draw, that these you know these lines are not drawn in this absurd way, but that's actually they are like expanding cycles of what we consider worthy of being similar enough with us. Um, and that's why I say art can foster our fundamental connectedness, hopefully. And I think that is actually um, I believe in that, and I I'm, I'm excited. About Thank you. Um, I think maybe to start, I think one of the things that Eurydice um, brought up in her presentation was um, that there's a way we have to rethink the way art connects to the world. The traditional way of thinking about it in terms of there's art on one side and then there's reality on the other. And that's why we have galleries to keep them separate. Um, <laughs> And it seems also interesting that the works we've just seen, none of them was in a gallery context exactly. Um, but I wonder if you think that part of the responsibility in a way, but also the mission of the artist is to rethink the sphere in which art itself sets in relation to the world. Because um, you've all talked in a way about its connections to real issues, um, real people, uh, real problems with history. And I wonder if you could speak to that a little bit, because I think, you know, if you took my mother, for example, she thinks art is something that belongs into gallery. If you took my father, who grew up in a different part of the world, um, then he would say that a lot of exist in the house and they exist in um, urban space and they exist 
in what we might call craft, but they have practical uses, art uses, but distinction is a bit more blurry. Um, so I wonder what you could say to that. You're, yes, you're on mute. Um, me? Uh, yeah, Who are you like, say all of us? Yeah. Okay. I mean, I think this because I think you all have slightly different perspectives on this, a shared one at the same time about, you know, in order for art to have some sort of agency, it can't be completely disconnected from reality. Mm. Yeah, I would just like to we'll contribute a little bit. I think I think one of the points that I'm trying to make is that what Nana spoke about this idea of working with the micro and 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 the macro um, uh, uh, cells. Of, of, of our existence, this institutional uh, art spaces, architectures, everything quite structural, uh, and, 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 and then coming back to our uh, actual um, representations and everyday existences, as you made your, your example, this idea that art uh, only belongs in particular architectures is is and, and, and we experience as we experience is these these works outside as we can, can like really be aware of of and conscious that art is everywhere is is a particular uh, personal experience so how do you work with these two scales between the personal and the collective this is something that is very as julian was speaking about this idea of um, perspective so how these two spaces can start to speak to each other the collective doesn't have to take over the personal neither the personal does not have to take over the over the collective experience so how do we make space for 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 fiction between these two uh scales of living because we we we, we move between these two spaces how do we make sure that they are in between spaces gray areas you know within the collective experience and the um, personal experience, the home, the architecture of the home, and the architecture of the of the institution. How these two can create a third, fourth, fifth object where other possible experiences can take place. So this is something that I'm always thinking about: how a shared experience can be a personal, intimate experience and a collective experience, how these two move along. And they don't have to necessarily uh, be a community project. They can just, you know, exist in their particular values. So this is something that, that really works in my mind. I'm always trying to create things that go in that direction. Mm. And then I wonder if you could maybe talk a little bit more about that in relation to um, your practice as a teacher and educator. Because I think in terms of art education, is it about giving people agency or a sense of agency and a voice and a sense that their voice has a valid place in the world? Um, how does that work? Right. Well, I, I do think that there are so many uh, possibilities that are out there. And uh, one of the things that I've <clears throat> tried to push back against is this notion of conditioned knowledge or um, having to be boxed within a certain uh, parameter or prism of, uh, of functionality or, or, or modes of, of conduct or ways of, of, of doing things. Uh, for me, in my teaching practice, I do try to uh, break out of the mode and try different ways of engaging, which would include, uh, you know, having to, to have learning done in the outdoor spaces or bringing in, you know, cultural values that expand thinking or, you know, so generally trying to, to make the educational setting uh, or, or the experiences of everyone, the, the classroom, as opposed to having a constructed uh, knowledge uh, whereby people can say certain things or do certain things, but, you know, try to expand it so that it becomes a really rich layer of experience that come together to create that voice. So it's not one voice, it's all voices that matter. And so agency, yes, uh, I think is humans have agency that's central in that 
in that way. But for me, I'm also very key on on tapping them into other agencies, uh, other kinds of um, energies, if you will, or think powers or material forces that contribute to this. And that's why your work, um, uh, Jillian, is so fascinating to me because you're bringing physics as this thing uh, that is embodying all these other sort of like ideas of of entanglement, which I think is such a huge part of our existence. And so that needs to be at the core of our conversations. How do we entangle and enmesh and become one force as opposed to separate agencies and separate things? We can all kind of work together because art should be life and life should be art, right? There should be some that kind of intersectionality. Yeah. Um, maybe, Julian, it would be maybe interesting to hear about when you moved from experimental physics to art i mean what was the the drive that made you want to talk I, about I always wanted to be an artist you know i started with the drawing and, and printmaking and i was kind of a tourist in physics all the time but i took it very seriously so i got you know i i, I, I actually i read about quantum physics i was so blown away and i said there's no way that's true so i had to hear it from the horse's mouth that's how i felt <laughs> but you're always making artwork to represent what you were doing no while, while physics i basically at that point i was like so involved that i didn't do art for like eight years or so but then i kind of slip, moved to the u.s and slipped back and i had no idea what i was doing i went to art college and, and enrolled into sculpture i've never made a sculpture in my life i was 29 the first time and so and then i just got all into that yeah. and christian i want to turn to you a bit because i think one of the things we're talking about is engaging with a world that's complex and entangled. Um, and how as an artist can you represent that world, be part of that world, whilst at the same time allowing an audience to engage with a clarity of message? Yeah, well, this is a, a huge question for, for every artist, I guess. Um, what I'm trying to do more and more is kind of finding a way how, how to... Uh, I mean, it, I'm interested in what Julian presented because he's also trying to find a way how to make something accessible that happens in a very closed space normally, like quantum physics. Who understands quantum physics? Right? But if you if you get more into it, it's mind blowing because it's kind of, it's, it's actually really um, encouraging this shift of thinking that I was talking about. That you understand yourself as a being in this world in a completely different way and not in this enclosed <laughs> subjectivity that we are used to look upon ourselves. And uh, I, I, I try to do uh, maybe something similar with different means, but I'm trying to engage more and more living matter into my works, which have, uh, you know, which are an organism uh, by themselves. And there's a, a relation going on between the body of uh, the exhibition's visitor and this other organism which represents uh, sometimes a very, uh, very different time span, which is uh, out of the, out of the time dimension that we normally think ourselves in, in terms of life. For example, I've, I've worked with plants that have uh, been grown out of seeds that uh, were found in the Siberian permafrost and they were in there for 32,000 years, frozen all the time. So there was still some life in these seeds, which could be reanimated. And then you have these plants, which, um, which you cannot find in nature today anymore. So it's, it's, it's a piece of ice age nature that suddenly appears and acts uh, in our presence. And so I found, uh, found it interesting to relate myself, but also the visitors towards this other organism, which seems to come from a different time in which uh, human influence, for example, was completely different than it is today. And so this is, for example, one way of working that I'm, in right now. And do you think there's a logical extension to that, that um, you'd want to address or engage non-human audiences? So you talked about the visitor assuming a person in a way, but there's ways in which um, seeds can go beyond that to engage with other biological life. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, the beauty of it is, is that, you know, uh, as opposed to any other, other material, if you like, that you, that you would work with in, in art or in an exhibition. Uh, this is not a material, but it's something which is, you know, a, a thing in itself, which kind of opposes also uh, the introduction into art. There's some sort of a resistance that they express 
towards becoming art. And I quite like this, uh, this tension that, that comes into the exhibitions by introducing them into it. Uh, I feel like it kind of, sh- it kind of creates a shift towards how we approach art or how we relate ourselves towards art. Um, Etienne, you've been quiet a little bit. Um, I wonder, do um, any of the things you've heard from the other speakers speak towards a, a change in the way art is distributed or the way a gallery should operate? Sure. I mean, what I liked about uh, Nena's uh, statement is that the idea of energy and bringing the art out to the people. And of course, um, a small gallery is not a museum, but we want to make it possible that you look in different ways to, towards art. And also, of course, I mean, in, in a gallery, people can enter and can look at art without paying anything. So it's a possibility for everybody to just walk in. Unfortunately, people are always a little bit, um, um, have reservations. But, um, I mean, we are not really in a, in a, in a situation or in a position to offer, um, um, how can I say, a, a seminar or something, but at least to have a certain broader view to how to uh, react towards object, but also towards um, um, political uh, situations. But it all depends on the artist. So if an artist um, is coming to the gallery and she or he suggests to do... Um, to show something with his art, then this is certainly something which we are able to, to give the pl- platform. I think this is an important thing. I mean, um, when, what, what is a little bit taken out of the discussion is the, the economic point of view, um, the commercial point of view in which is involved in the art world, but not in the arts. I mean, the arts is, is a, of course, a much broader uh, subject, but there are some kind of restrictions from the outside, and you need a certain, um, let's say, yeah, platform or a certain habitat to be able to expand your ideas. I mean, also um, Julian has some restrictions, also technical restrictions and commercial restrictions. I mean, I don't know about um, the other, I mean, you need your, Nena probably needs her kind of um, university background or, so how is the structure you, from which you're working? I think that's uh, something we, we're trying in a very kind of um, a humble way um, to facilitate this uh, for artists in their practice. Yeah, unfortunately, it's, even though it feels like we only just got going, <laughs> we've run out of our elapsed time. But I want to say, in some ways, um, this panel is an example, in a way, of how arts can um, foster a shared humanity, because we've had um, lots of things that connect, lots of things that are particular to everyone's practice. Um, and I think maybe just the fact that there's discussion around art, that it provokes debate, provokes, as you've said, different perspectives, different ways of thinking is um, one of the things that should make Christian more optimistic um, about the future. But I'd like to thank all the speakers uh, for their contributions. It's really been a, a privilege to be part of this conversation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for being thank the host, you. Mark. And, yeah, uh, you're nice. Well done. Brilliant job.